Hello. Here, in a small corner of the audio internet, we dive into film, TV, literature and games with in-depth review, discussion and analysis. My name's Rachel and you're listening to The Narrative Labyrinth. And today is the second half of a two-parter framed around the R Flag Means Death fandom. And what is the importance of diverse storytelling in media? As this is the second part, I strongly recommend you go back and listen to part one, where you'll be introduced to our guests and the format of the show. If you've already listened to part one, welcome back. Let's begin. So uh, I think it's fair to say that Our Flag Means Death had a Mm -hmm. kind of British style season to it. You know, those shorter seasons, fewer episodes. It had this kind of three three season plan, um, but they've they've they failed to do the final season. Obviously, there's a big call to have that third season produced somewhere um, by a distributor. Um, But what then like is this a call to have it continue is it more made do we want like an ncis 25 are we after a gray's anatomy style thing here (laughs) Um i i will not rest i will not rest until i have and you know that's just basically consigning my life to um chaos uh, however long it is but uh, <laughs> this sentence i want to use is i will not rest until i have eight hours of full frontal sex between ed and steve <laughs> oh my God. it's so childish to me but i'm so obsessed with them and i Maybe we need to be starting an OnlyFans. I'm right. <laughs> right. Come on, Taika. <laughs> Give us what we want. That's the streamer we haven't <gasps> looked at yet. Well, I think there is good benefit to that, actually, because you have you can set your own episode length. Um, so you could, you know, let your... your it doesn't your... matter, though. The length doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, I know you're being filthy, but I'm being genuine here. You know, there's, there's, there's. You think I'm being filthy? You've <laughs> met me. Yes. <laughs> there is no nuance here. The funniest oh, part about this is that. <laughs> okay, amidst this, the amidst this, is the giant spectrum, I'm... and I'm the one who's like, what are the <laughs> Okay, so that's actually what I was gonna say. Is like. Okay, as someone who is asexual, like, I only actually know one person, Mm -hmm. um, IRL, who is also ace. And they're actually my only, our flag IRL as well. And there was a moment where we were sitting around in the lobby at EC3, um, the con in Seattle, Mm -hmm. and someone had said that they were ace. And I was like, you know, I keep hearing that. I keep seeing other ace people. So I was like, oh, ace, ace. So we just all sat around and did the, like, ace, ace, like the badminton eye thing and like pointing at each other and i'm like very curious it's uh something i brought up a lot i'm very curious to know why we are like so over over overrepresented is the wrong way of saying it because people take that as meaning as like oh there shouldn't be as many of us but i mean it's a lot of us who are in who are in this (laughs) who are in this fandom and i've never like most of the ace people i know i know just because of like you know this fandom and stuff like that so it's yeah, it's it's really interesting to see how many people from how many different experiences. Like there's mm. the like you know the um we I need eight hours of full frontal to the like I, I know I want I just need them to like cuddle because they weren't sitting together on the bed. <laughs> like not that one is better than the other, but it's just like it's so usually yeah. there's like it skews towards one or the other. Usually there's not. I've never. Well, this is really my first band. I would take life, that. But like, I would take that. I've never been in another space where I'm like, oh, everyone turn on. This. There's an entire Ace server dedicated to just like our flag. Shout yeah. out to Leah who runs that server. Um, no, you know what? I should have known I was Ace sooner. I never participated in fan fiction either. until me this either. Day. Oh my gosh! Wow. Mm-hmm. That includes growing up in the fandom that must not be named, oh. the Twilight fandom. Oh, I wouldn't name that one either. And the Glee fandom. Glee. Oh, that's a choice. I was in the Glee fandom and I read no fanfic. <laughs> I should have known I was Ace so much sooner. But it's Ace Week at the moment for our flag. They're doing an event. It is. And there's some great stuff being published that's making me cry my eyes out in such a good way. Like, it's so validating. 
there is a real lack of ace representation because it's like you know it's all about like young romances and there's no kind of you know, even the Hunger Games where they murder all the children. Oh, you still mm. want to have that love triangle. They're still fucking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, right. You know, that is, that is yeah. I feel that's kind of, we're, we've started to get there a lot more with kind of queer relationships and we've kind of moved on from everyone must come out. Uh, you know, that is your one and only gay story is coming out. You know, I, in my life, I thought I'd have to come out way more than I actually do based on the media I was kind yeah. of susceptible to in my in my teens. Yeah. yeah nothing nothing yeah. but coming out stories. Coming out stories, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Traumatising ones. Yeah. It's really lackluster when you do it, really. Devastating ones as well. You can't have good ones, so they have to be devastating. It's come out or or die, then come out, or come out, then die. Like, pick your pick your choice. Yeah. You know, that's why we all wrote fan fiction, right? Even in franchises that shall no longer be named um, and others, yeah. you know, we would look for that subtext, even if it wasn't <laughs> there. We are now at a point where we are getting those stories, even if they are cut short. But what we're still not getting is that full spectrum of representation, is my understanding um and we're, we're not getting that ace representation but that yeah. is so that's kind of taken the space of where you used to find the subtext in in kind of the queerness <laughs> it's now specifically you're finding the subtext of aceness is that correct like yeah i have such a bee in my bonnet about this yeah <laughs> i have never really talked openly about being demisexual with my friends and anybody in real life even though i've known i was demi since probably 2015 roughly 2014 2015 um, because the minute I started talking about asexuality and people started talking about it, it became the butt of a joke much in this, like at that same time, two things were very funny to people and they're things that are not in any way funny now, or at least they shouldn't be. And it was asexuality and polyamory. Um, and so I've been very quiet about being on the ace spectrum for years now, like almost a decade now, because of the way people responded to it so negatively even people in the queer community, like my queer friends were the ones doing this. Um, and it was something I would kind of take bit by bit in conversations with potential partners and things like that. And that's a whole conversation I could go on at length about is how potential partners um, treat people when they find out that you're on the A spectrum. Um, but this show is the reason I feel comfortable talking about being ace now and the reason that I feel comfortable claiming my space in the queer community um, because I have never felt truly queer. Like I grew up thinking that to be queer meant you dated somebody of the same sex or somewhere in between or anything like that. Like I, I never saw myself as being queer because I thought, well, I just experienced sex differently. Um, and I think we're kind of at the point right now with asexuality that we were with bisexuality probably like a decade ago, where bisexuality was treated very cruelly in a lot of spaces as like, oh, like being a choice or like any, like all kinds of awful stuff people said. And so I'm hopeful that we will start to get more ace representation um, I cried like a baby at the scenes in Heartstopper because that's <clears throat> who I am as a person. Um, but it, it is interesting to me that with all of the queer media we have, there's still such a shortage of a spectrum stories, um, especially when it comes down to a romantic mm. people, because, you know, when romance is at the core of everything, not just explaining asexuality, but explaining a romantic <laughs> tendencies to people it, it, tendencies <laughs> makes it sound like a diagnosis wow evil tendencies the ace phobe is in the ace person <laughs> but like it is i will admit it is disappointing to me that we don't have any explicit ace representation in the show i i feel like they've been very explicit that they had mm -hmm. uh non-binary writers uh, queer yes. writers. I kind of feel like with David at the helm, if they weren't writing mm -hmm. explicit ace characters, it's because they didn't have an ace writer. Well then, if we get a season three, right. hey David, <laughs> hey Bessie, hey. what's up? The girls yes, can see. Exactly. Can hire an I ace. all the writing I've already done about it. Um, but yeah, you, know, you know, you know, a character named Frenchie. 
Yeah. Also, buttons to me as well. Just reads is so just so like you know I yeah, get to make sweet sweet love. To that man just wants to make sweet and love just be like because you know yeah. was that really mean? You know. So I really anyway. Okay. So okay, let me just say for me the the whole ace. That's a whole other. You know, I don't want to mm-hmm. get too distracted from the point of your actual podcast, um, Rachel, and everything. But yeah, the, mm-hmm. the idea of just like ace representation in the media is like it's so abysmal and i can relate to what you're saying cc about being like a lot of times it was like queer people so the kind of journey i went on is i was very you know um you know from like a young age being like oh i'm pan a lot of people told me like that i'm friends Mm -hmm. with now who are like queer and everything like oh you were the first person i'd ever like known who was pan or i like this sounds so self-important, but people always tell me that, oh, you're so important in my journey because you were, like, out and, like, this, and I had never heard that term, and they, like, you know, can resonate with this, and da 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 So it was interesting when I came as ace, they're like, oh, I thought you were pan, I thought you were pan, and a lot of people think that pan and ace are opposites, and I'm like, it's such a thin line. No. It's such a thin line. And being like, oh, so did you lie to me all these years? And that also just gave me, like, such anxiety about it because, like, people see it as opposites. Yeah. But I'm like... The whole basis of panness, at least for me, how I experienced it, and I still do consider myself pan romantic, is like gender not influencing attraction. And I'm like, yes, because that yeah. attraction was zero. Like that's why everyone was equal. Yes, yes, gender did not influence your lack of attraction. Like good going, <laughs> like yes. good going, king or whatever, good going, champ. Um, so I like, I like, you know, can relate to that. I mean, like, it's it, it was other. Um, people be like, oh, I thought, but what about this? What about this? And being like, oh, like, am I no longer valid? Am I no longer able to pursue um, relationships? Because there's always that extra thing of like pressure. Be like, oh, I don't really want to do this. I don't want to do this. You just haven't found the right person. And I'm like, that's like if someone was like, oh, you know, yes. you would really enjoy a root canal. And you're like, no, I don't think I would. I don't think I do. I don't think I would enjoy a root canal. And they're like, you just haven't found the right <laughs> dentist. With the right dentist, I'm telling you, you would be <laughs> no. volunteering every night to have like a root canal or something. You're like, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know about that. Um, but yes. Anyway, I think what is so, um, what I my theory as to why ace people are so able to relate to the our flag is the fact that they didn't make it about you know quote unquote coming out they didn't make it even about physical attraction it's just about like as i think david put it the challenge of like letting yourself be loved and showing someone yourself and having that be the challenge rather than it be a like fight of like about different like identities or, or different things like that just like so I think the idea of just like love and stuff like that is something that has struck like a core of the ace community and why we're so um, overrepresented. And by overrepresented, I don't mean like, oh, there should be less of us. So some people yeah, take that. I mean, like be. as compared statistically, they're like, why are we all congregated in this, in this space? If you took a um, poll of everyone's like orientation, like it's more than would be in the like, if you took like a general poll if that makes sense. So, yes, I agree. Ace representation, bloody terrible. But we are talking about this whole issue, corporate control over programming, which affects the content that we see. And I was just trying to work out how old, how long ago it was that I was aware of a gay character on British television who was being played purely for laughs and effeminate gay man. And And I'm thinking it's only 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. So if you're talking, so a lot of these executives are going to be my age and they grew up with that and that is still their normal. Now, it's not the normal of their children who are 20 or, you know, possibly even 30 if they got started really young. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, and Ellen DeGeneres came out in 97. So you're talking about, 23, 26 years since mainstream television coped really fucking badly with someone coming out on television and and losing their job and losing their career and everything and then having to wait until stupid people had calmed down before she could resume her career. I think that when you put that backdrop behind what you're saying, and I'm not saying it's right in 
any way, shape, or form. We've barely got representation for gay people. Oh, um, absolutely. They're like, can't you see that we 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 did this one thing and like weren't we so amazing at us? Please, please pat us on the back. Also, we're gonna cancel it, but please pat or, pat us on the back of the fact we that we did, did it. it. Yeah. Um, begrudgingly, begrudgingly, we did it for like a season <laughs> or two. One of the, one of the and, sentences I wrote down earlier was, "Why do they want a, another gay program? We gave them one last year." They see it as a box to check and not an actual. Yeah. Like, I think while we're talking about like things that did it poorly, I have to say like um, things that did it well, it's, like BoJack Horseman till to mm. this day is the best. Like there are people who are, like if yeah. I say like, Ace, they're like, oh, like okay, like Todd and BoJack Horseman. And what yeah. struck me about yes. that is like as opposed to like um, box checking and things like that, where I feel like even though they said a couple things were meaningful, like in the um, with Florence and sex ed, it was just like one character. Oh, we did everything. We checked a check mark, checked a check box, mark, whatever you know, box mark. Mm-hmm. We put a check mark yeah. in the check box. <laughs> um, but <laughs> what struck me with Bojack Horseman is like, it was actually introduced like to make Todd's character more interesting. It made him a more interesting and complex character. Mm-hmm. Todd, it wasn't to, to check a box. Like that was something that actually made his character more compelling and more interesting and, and, you know, usually in, I feel, this few, the little bits of, like, ace rep that we get, it's like, oh, a, how to put this, compensating for, oh, like, you know, yes, you're broken and, uh, and ugly, disgusting, but it's okay, you know, type of thing. Like, see, you can still live yeah. a worthwhile life, where as opposed to, like, this actually makes his character more interesting and compelling to people. And I was like, mm-hmm. that is so unique. And I will say, please do not... uh be offended by this but and this also just shows like no demographic is a monolith or any anything like like no one is going to agree on things but like i felt so upset like i literally like like upset cried over hearts uh, over heart stopper like an opposite way because i've mm-hmm. found that like i knew that there was going to be an ace character in the second season and mm-hmm. i was so upset by the fact that when i saw a character who is like quiet and reading i was like that's who they're going to put as the ace character because i've also had so many yeah. people tell me be like oh like you're not ace like basically my personality is too big for it or like oh you're this or you're not quiet you're not bookish you're not all these things that Isaac is that they're showing like I'm like yeah I'm ace but I don't have to sit at a part I can like enjoy a party with my friends I don't sit there and like read a book and like basically everything I feel Mm -hmm. like people have told me like oh like are you sure because like look at these things it's like oh you're not like this character Isaac that they've put up here and like I don't know he's like represented to me everything that I'm not I guess and everything people are like oh this is what an ace person should be whereas Todd is like more like you know man has all these kind of different things going mm-hmm. and speaking of sex ed if you'd watched the last season they actually had Yasmin Benoit who is a asexual model activist black and she was the first asexual person to walk in Manhattan pride and everything and she does so much work about like how people think aces aren't discriminated against and it's like we're especially in the UK a big target of conversion Mm -hmm. therapy I can't go to the doctor and tell them that because they're gonna be like oh well what's something's wrong with you let's put you know these types of interventions or medic medicational thing they see it as a symptom and things like that and like all these real ways in which ace people are like genuinely discriminated against she does a lot of work with that and does a lot of work, you know, pushing the community. She gets a lot of hate for it, too, because she's a model. So you're like, oh, why are you wearing these, quote unquote, skimpy clothing and then talking about how you're ace? But they brought her on as a consulting. We're talking about writers being in the room. They brought her on as a consulting writer for the last season of Sex Education. And she was really proud of it. So she was, like, going on these, like, different tours about it. Seeing it, it was extremely offensive. <laughs> Watching it, it was extremely offensive. I'm like, how could they, like, do this, did it, whatever. And seeing her say, like, oh, they cut so much of what I wrote. And being like, so you had us in the room to be like, oh, we had an ace, you know, an ace voice or even, you know, a black ace voice, which is already so rare. Right. Because, like, um, again, people's stereotypes is, like, white, quiet, nerdy. Like, uh, they're like, okay, then it makes sense for you to be ace. But God forbid you have, like, a, you know, more, la- quote, unquote, louder personality or you have, like, you know, these types of, I don't know the right way to put this. Any yeah, but like, yeah. Think- be like shy or quiet or bookish or like socially quote unquote awkward then it's like okay well no 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 now it doesn't make sense like god forbid you be you know a black model and have you know and be like beautiful and like i like wearing you know lingerie and stuff like that in my in my shoots so it's like to be like we're in the room and you still cut out 
because they felt it made the main white character look bad and and what ended up being the last season. So to be like, I'm even then I'm so proud of the work I did consulting, but then actually seeing it and be like, wow, the ace character is the villain. And she uses her, the fact that she's ace to like, um, basically hide her problematic behavior. She's like, okay, yes. Like when she gets called out, she's like, yes, I did do this, but you know what? I'm ace and da da da. So really he's the bad guy for like outing me and everyone applauds. They're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And it's like really gross. And, you know, just hearing what, like, Yasmin said, like, no, this was originally what was supposed to happen. And, like, you know, it was supposed to be clear that, like, he was making, that he knew that she was ace and thus making these kinds of things. Because in the show, it just, like, comes out of nowhere, basically. And be like, well, guess what? I'm ace. So, like, I have avoid accountability. And I remember just going online and seeing all these people just saying all these horrible things. Like, oh, of course, they took the most, like, annoying, self-centered character. And said, of course, they would be ace and, like... You know, they just like want like attention, all these types of things. So again, sorry to bring it back to our flag. The fact that like, at least in the first season, you know, I think there was a lot of, especially re the polyamory of it all, a lot of network pushback. But the fact that in the first season, it's like, not only do we have these writers in the room, we're listening to them. We're not just mm-hmm. going to go and put this out, be like, hey, guess who was a great consultant? Guess like we have these people in the rooms. You can't say that, that this was wrong. But being like, we actually listened to them. And in listening to them, we made the story better. We made the story more compelling. If, if you know, Jim's character had just been like a woman in disguise or something like that, I don't think it would have been as compelling a show. Or, you know, like not having this like extra like layer of nuance. I think, you know, Vico made Jim a more interesting character <sighs> overall, mm-hmm. just being who they are and just like, again, the gender expansive writers and stuff that were in the room. And they listened and, to them. They listened to and them. And they listened to them. And they listened to them. So I'm like, it's again, it's so hard because it's like, one, can we even get the show made where this is the concept where the things are happening? Two, can we get writers in the room? Three, can we get actors who actually understand these characters and are like fight not like fighting for these characters, we're influencing these characters. And if we have these writers, can we like listen to them and not cut out everything they say and not like um, consult them on whatever script edits we make and just assume, oh yeah, no, this is still fine because hey, they worked on the original one. And stuff like that. So anyway, I'm sorry. I went on a whole like, rant. But yes, there is a lot. I have many, many feelings about this. I've written about it extensively. My feelings about, you know, like ace representation, how it has, uh, you know, failed so many people and how few good examples there are of it. I've and got yes. a little bit of a um, tangent thing from the point of um, there not being that explicit ace rep and then us as fans kind of creating that by um, creating our own works from it and stuff like that. Um, I've seen it in the way that we've um, kind of created our own trans rep in it as well. Because we do have Jim, and Jim is an amazing mm-hmm. rep in it. We also have Spanish Jackie's husbands. Two of them are trans. Um, they're mm-hmm. not explicitly big characters, yes. but they are both played by trans people, trans mass people, and I think like that is just really amazing. Um, but... There's been a lot of work from especially um, trans people who are in the community and fans of it that are seeing like, oh, what if um, Steed was trans? What if Ed was trans? And during season one, um, all of us were like, yeah, this is just our like headcans. We're having a bit of fun. Um, and we're exploring ourselves while exploring the characters, which I think is why queer media mm-hmm. is important because a lot of time it helps us explore who we are through a fictional lens so we can experiment a little bit. And I feel like that's really useful for people to be able to do. Um, and then in season two, um, similar kind of thing. And But one thing that really stood out was when um, the like non-renewal cancellation thing of season three was announced, Jess Tom, who's one of the writers on Our Flag Means Death, who is a um, trans person as well, um, had posted a bit of the script that was in season two yes. of Ed saying goodbye to his like leathers that he's been wearing this whole time. And he chucks it into the sea and he sees his reflection in the water. And I think it's in a barrel or something. And um, he's, he's saying goodbye, Blackbeard. And then he looks at himself, sees himself a lot more softer and a lot more himself really. And says, hello, Ed. And Jess, Tom said that like, this is a trans allegory story this moment in it so suddenly it felt like stuff that we were doing as fans wasn't just what we'd been doing for years and multiple different fandoms it was something that was there in the writing it was there in the room 
and we're not just reading into things. So there is power in creating your own stories for stuff. Even if we have so much queer representation in one story, we can always make more. Mm-hmm. And we can and go I further. Love that they never, I love that they never, like, we never ever got back from David or, um, you know, if there was a story about Izzy being trans, that Con was always just fucking Complete delighted. Support. Mm. just mm-hmm. happy as a pig in shit that he could I, mean, I don't know what to do because he's not trans in a piece of it also they let us they welcomed it they respect they they respected the the artistic effort they respected our investment in what they had given us and our development of it in our own way. Mm. And I think that is really special. Sorry, go on, you, you go, Leila. Oh, no, I just want to say that, like, I kind of, you know, went, like, off and down a tangent about the, the ace rep thing. But it really actually, for me, wasn't stemming from, like, our flag. It was just talking about, like, you were talking about the, the lack of ace rep in general, and that is a passionate topic for me. Um, and I understand that there's not necessarily, like, you know, ex, quote unquote explicit ace rep, but there's also in, in our flag, but there's not really explicit anything rep in yeah, our right. flag. So something really? I appreciate, though, is like why yeah. it lends itself to like people like Frenchie or people who like, you know, like Frenchie, we yeah. John, there are characters whose plot lines do not revolve around romance and they have so much, so many more interesting things about them than like, you know, who they're in love with. Like, of course, like, Olu has his wonderful yeah. like, polycule and everything. But Frenchie is like, you know, like, I'm going to, like, scan these rich people. Like, and, like, that's, you know, super interesting to us. Normal and super ace to us. And you don't, yeah, and you don't think, exactly, normal ace activity. But you normally, like, you don't think anything's <laughs> missing from his life, if that makes sense. So right. even though it's not explicit, I do think, like, in our, in our flag, like, the fact that a character can just not have no one has labels these one labels but they can not be having anything even like romantic or seen on screen as romantic and still have value mm. i think that's important to ace rep yeah. and in in, its, in itself and that they are they could be self-actualized without romance like no one's like oh like frenchie's a flat character roach is a flat character or something like that because they're not they don't have 20 husbands you know <laughs> we for a very long time we only saw uh, female characters in relation to the guy. We only got the male gaze. You never got a picture of his ass. We only got a picture of her ass. You can wish. One of the gr- the greatest the greatest moment for me in the episode where Ed uh, and we first get the Nossie and number five. It did just before that when Ed turns round and we have that to me, extremely lovely shot of Ed's ass, um, caressed by lamplight. <laughs> and uh, and I just thought this is the difference, isn't it? The, the gaze is equal and the characters are valid whether or not they are in that gaze from whomever that is. So they don't need a romantic story. They're valid people without that. Yeah. The plot is valid if it isn't about you know, th- like going back to the Bechtel thing, you know, uh, the, the only conversation that the the female lead ever had was about the guy or about the relationship. You know, they didn't talk about their job. They didn't talk about their family. They didn't have any other problems. It was just the guy didn't phone. And so it's really, really nice to see in our flag that all of them exist with or without and are valid with or without i think that's mm-hmm. been a really yeah. powerful thing yeah and i think again that's something that can like resonate a lot with the ace community sorry i just realized that when the whole rant like it might have sounded like our flag was i wasn't even thinking about our flag sorry i was thinking about the ace front that does exist but again i know like you know it may be disappointing to some that it's not explicit but i'm like what is explicit in the show and i think right. the way that yeah. they show that like that's not the only way a person can have value that's not the only way that a person can be meaningful in a group of people and be mm-hmm. meaningful to their friends as having some sort of romantic or sexual right. um, affiliation, if that makes sense. So I think that in itself is really, you know, it's incredibly powerful. It's, it's a, yeah, it's incredibly powerful, especially to like a lot of like, you know, the ace people who have resonated with that's, it. That's why I think so many ace people are drawn to it is because 
in a lot of more like cishet media, you get relationships that are founded on nothing. Mm -hmm. Just because people have to be in one. So yeah, Yeah, they just smash people together for no reason. Or it's just about sex or people are motivated by sex. Yes. Yes. And that's why like a lot of my historic like favorite ships are ones where like they either took a while to get there or it was like enemies to lovers or whatever. Like I'm a big Nick Miller, Jess Day girl. Mm -hmm. I'm a big um, Leslie Nope, Ben Wyatt girl. I'm wearing my Parks and Rec right now. Um, <laughs> love Parks and Rec. Um, I really love Kurt and Blaine. Like, not to be that girl, but, like, I was a clean girl. Um, shocking, That's I know. Sort of thing. I'm sorry, <laughs> finish, finish your point. So shocking. So to have these relationships... I'm so sorry. To have these relationships founded on such strong connections beyond just whether or not they're sexually compatible... Mm-hmm. I think that's what draws ace people to the story because that's something that a lot of us can connect to. I think it draws intelligent people. I would hope so. I mean, I am so bored. I mean, I made I made the joke earlier about the, you know, I won't rest till I've had eight hours of full frontal <laughs> Evan Steed. I mean, it is a joke. I, I, I mean, <laughs> well, I know it's not going to happen. It, uh, it, it lives up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my God. That was like being at school. <laughs> Jesus, I went back forty years in a heartbeat. So my my my, my I I want to kind of summarize what you, you I think between the the trans rep and the ace rep. I think what you're what I'm getting from this as a as someone who doesn't fit either of those categories is. 10 15 years ago let's just say 10 let's be realistic you know we used to have to ship and find the space for those those gay relationships let's not even just say queer let's be straight out let's be narrow about this those gay relationships had to be found in the subtext now that's becoming more open we're now not quite there with full queer representation it's getting better we we know it's getting better but you know as people that fit in those communities you are now finding those subtext ships because they're not yet i suppose yeah yeah that's what i'm trying to get yeah i i think personally like to me it's not maybe i'm just over uh Maybe I'm reading into things too deeply or I'm just like too easily pleased because we've had so little. But I just in general, like just even if the word ace isn't used, even if the ace wasn't the intention, just having characters who are their only value, having characters whose only value isn't their romantic affiliations, isn't their sexual affiliations and still being very well-rounded characters, still being well-liked characters in their community and things like that. I do think that that is a big thing and not something you see in a lot of other media, even a lot of other queer media, you don't even see that. It's like, yeah, um, I think that's, to bring it back to Heartstopper, Heartstopper, Hearts, yes, Heartstopper. To bring it back to Heartstopper, it's like his, um, I felt that his asexuality was stopping him from fitting in with his friends, if that makes sense. It's being like, oh, I can't relate and like not just because I can't relate to your personal experiences and your personal romance, but just I can't relate to you in general. And I'm just so, I need to be in the corner. I need to be like going to reading, like everyone's, as we show shots of everyone, their romantic relationships, it's me with a book and all of that. And so I think seeing like someone who like, even if they're not explicitly ace, seeing people who are just not involved in romantic things and being like, they still have value. They still fit into our community. I still think that is like, in a way better, like to me personally, better ace rep than a lot of other things I've seen. And being like, yeah, like I think I have, you know, I'm my own things to bring to things. I can have a unique, quote unquote, unique personality, unique perspective, or like all the uh, different things I feel about aesthetic and different views I have on things. And I don't feel like being ace like affects my friendships or any way like my advice to my friends is always just like no go get that dick girl like go get that dick like you know so like it does not um you know affect affect I guess my value to my friends and things like that so again even if the character is not ace having characters that don't center or at least in this current moment at least how we see them don't center romantic relationships, don't center sexual relationships and still are just as valid and are still just as included in the overall narrative. I think that is something that you don't see a lot either way. So yes, it's like, you know, be nice if things were like, you know, more inferred, more implied, but even without that, it's still 
miles and leaps ahead of a lot of the other things we're getting, including, you know, in some cases, explicit, you know, ace rap. It's like, yes, you said the word ace buzzword, but at, at what cost? Like, please, <laughs> at what cost? Um, so back to Ben's point too, the creators aren't ashamed of us with these head cannons, whereas like we talked about earlier, a lot of fandoms get really uncomfortable when people make these kind of head cannons. And it's not that we're like necessarily encouraged to do it in some of these cases, but like they seem happy that we're doing it. Like they seem genuinely glad to be a part of all of us having this journey and finding ourselves in these characters where yep. we can. And fan fiction has saved series before. Like the only reason Star Trek ever got past yes. its first ever, ever season was fan fiction and a fan led campaign. And I think there's a lot of similarities between that and where our flag is now, um, based on at the time what was huge representation yeah. for the 60s. But that was predominantly women. Mm-hmm. Um, not that this is necessarily predominantly women, but you know, it was it was the people that the media was not made for. You know, uh, female audience were the yeah. ones. Yeah, the marginalized. That is the word I could not find at 3 a.m. Thank you. Yeah, the marginalized. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Well, I I don't think women are seen as people. I don't think queer people are seen as people by this particular kind of corporate-led entertainment industry. Absolutely not. We're there to be raped, murdered, hopefully at the same time. Two for one. For a man to... Yeah. Potentially by a parent. While making a sandwich. (laughs) Obviously, shows have come back from this point in the past. Um, you know, shows have been yeah. revived through fan campaign um, and films too. The the two key examples I I can I can bring forward for this, um, you know, because I've said there's loads. I've got two examples, um, but that's more than one, so I'm taking it. Um, is we had the Justice League uh, film, uh, which had a huge yes. fan campaign. So the fans. Um, really Mm -hmm. rallied and they spent months and months petitioning for this this this, for it to be re-edited and redone and completed as as they wanted it to be they flew planes they did billboards they they did a you know it was trending repeatedly on on social media they put real effort into kind of keeping that movement going and alive and thankfully there was a pandemic that meant warner brothers were like fuck it we'll chuck him six million and see what happens um so neighbors got revived through fan outcry um and although it's Exceedingly camp is not actually queer. And the, my last example um, is Warrior Nun, which had two seasons on Netflix. Yes. That had its its two seasons and had a massive campaign and is getting a third and final season or a movie or they, they are completing the story. Is that the hope for mm-hmm. our flag? What's the like what's the what's the game here? What's the what's the what do what do people want? I personally hope that a new streamer will pick the show up and complete it to whatever degree David and co thinks is appropriate. Um, I, I at least at the very least want the third season. Um, Cause I know that sometimes what happens when a show gets picked back up is like maybe a movie. I think Firefly is, is the one that that happened with um, same, something similar happened with Zoe's extraordinary playlist. That's a lesser known example. Cause that wasn't really a fan rally. It was more of, a smaller platform wanting to get content that people would watch. Um, we didn't, but they tried. Um, but I think the hope is for David to have the opportunity to at least wrap up the story. Um, because for me, it's not just about the show. It's that this is the second time this exact scenario has happened to David Jenkins specifically. Um, it happened with people of earth as well. And I think that's part of why he and the writers walked into season two, the way that they did. And honestly, I'm very curious what season two would have looked like without the rewrites that it sounds like they were asked to do by corporate. But that's another conversation. So my hope is it is picked up at least one season, but it sounds like they're toying with this spinoff idea, which I don't totally hate. um, Because I think what's beautiful about this show is that it is very much an ensemble comedy. And we have grown to love all of these characters, no matter how much screen time, screen screen time, uh, no matter how much screen time they do or do not get. Um, uh, So I don't think I personally have a lot of hope left in Max. I think they've really fumbled the bag in every way possible, and they've made that pretty clear. Um, So whatever we get, whether it's a season or a movie or um, 
you know, Samba recording <laughs> a bunch of videos for a YouTube channel, um, I'm happy to have it happen. Yeah, I feel like I'm on a similar thing. Like, I kind of want David's um, like vision of like three seasons to go ahead and. I would quite honestly be happy with just the three seasons as like fun as I think yeah. spin-offs could be. I I would be worried about it going into that territory of, you know, something like Supernatural or something where I get so many seasons where suddenly I'm like, yeah. I don't really give a shit about this is that's what's not even a risk on. anymore in modern television, honestly. Yeah, and I don't know, I it could just be me like liking things in set boxes and very neat. I, it'd be very nice to have it tied up, nice, neat little bow, see three seasons, completed story that has been set out from the beginning, really. Um, and another streamer would be like, they'd gain so much to gain the show. Like, they'd have yes. a whole huge fan base. We've got, there's like video evidence of like hundreds of people at conventions cheering and singing for this show. And mm-hmm. The amount of like the like HBO Max like doing merch, they probably made a shit ton of money on that because that was all overpriced. And then like the amount of not that it should be about money, but if they really want convincing about money things, the amount of stuff that fans make that they buy each other, there, <laughs> there it is. Um, the amount of stuff that fans make that people will buy for each other, like people are willing to spend money on this. Sh- yeah, love for the show. If that if that's I what spent, they need convincing, then um, parties. yeah, people people yeah. are willing. Not because we're like obsessed with like wanting to spend money or obsessed with capitalism, but being like this is so important to us. What will help this like continue? What will help this continue? And you know that like money is the only thing they care about. So it's like the only. I don't say card, the only like leveraging thing that a lot of us feel like we have is like, you know, showing our support and showing that like we view things that are done by the cast, showing that we support the things like when Mm -hmm. HBO Max finally, after all these, (laughs) after all this time, graced us with putting out like, let's be real subpar um, official merch (laughs) because the things fan artists were creating incredible, the things we were buying out from Target and Old Navy. (laughs) Much more aesthetic. It, that's me. Yeah, but yeah. Sorry, I'm just gonna say I, you know, agree with your point, Ben. And again, it's like the willing to spend money. It's not even about some love of capitalism or you know any nonsense like that. But being like, this seems to be the only bargaining chip we have in just wanting to see ourselves on screen, see a yeah. world in which people like us are happy, see a world in which people like us have a future, mm. and that seems to be the only way we can do this is by buying ugly blankets <laughs> like fine whatever like yeah. <laughs> whatever like, i don't know if i'm like if i must if i must <laughs> don't know if i'm talking out my ass when i say it but i feel like something i've seen from not just media but companies in general any kind of sector that you're in is for about the mm-hmm. past i want to say maybe less than 10 years but 10 years in that 10 years till now that gap mm-hmm. there's been a focus on edi so equality mm-hmm. um, diversity and inclusion there has been this more drive towards it and suddenly they're realizing that's not really making them any money by doing that so there's been quite a quick shift in a lot of um, organizations to suddenly be like oh we we're not gonna stop the edi stuff we're gonna keep doing Mm -hmm. it just we're not gonna add more or we might um draw it back a little bit just so we can um make sure we're making money and things and i like that what that's what worries me is that we're like, oh, we were doing that, so that's great, but we we need to care about, you know, the economy. Like, it's the it's the economy. You fucked, you fucked it up yourself. Fix it. Queer people, mm-hmm. we'll fix it. There are a lot of us. We can spot cynicism a mile away, and it's like you're you're trying. We we can yeah. see what you're doing. We can see you ticking your little box and cancelling our show, <laughs> and. We saw you last year and we had a look on Wikipedia and you did it with all these other shows when I was still at school and not, you know, watching content off my own bat. And we know that there's a history there. And so there is scepticism and there is cynicism, which is a terrible thing. And I'm, I feel like we're reflecting back at them. It's like, all right, be consistent. 
if you can be consistent and you can give us decent content that's well written and sensitive and respectful to your target audience and if you can do that sustained yeah. over a period of time maybe we'll trust you maybe we'll invest but you are going to have to take a loss for a while that's something because that, there's a lot of fucked off people out here that's something that i've been thinking been pissed a lot about. about is just the people who feel so put off by streaming in general right now like with where the economy is overall people are cutting entertainment costs in their budgets as much as they can. So this is not a unique to streamer issue. It's a unique to industry issue. Um, and the streamers are already feeling that. Like, I know that's why they're making these cuts. I know that's why they're kind of panicking. But I, I'm not sure how they reach the point where they think cutting things is better than finding a way to retain audiences that are passionate about their product, about their shows. Because to me... This show is a blessing to whatever platform, hopefully, fingers crossed, gets it. Because to get a show that has an engaged, active fandom that you know, we all know in this conversation, is going to be engaged with it years after, and people who are going to feel grateful to whatever platform saves it after, that's a gift. Like, we're going to be we're going to be clowns for that company forever. Like we're famous for clowning. We're going to be fat. We're going to be clowns for whatever company ideally picks it up. And I know that the question has come up and it's a very valid point of why would a company want to pick up a show that only has one season left, but there's very good points. Why wouldn't they, especially for when it's one that is, has this many eyes on it, has this much, much. <gasps> I love the clown nose. Um, it's a show that has so much attention and there's a lot to be said for streaming your favorite shows over and over again. I only have a Peacock subscription so I can watch Parks and Rec whenever my sad little heart desires to. Me with 30 Rock. Yes. I have it on while I'm sorry. Yes. And it's not just with neurodivergent people. It's everybody. Like it's this habit and watching that we have the luxury to have with streaming now where you know, back before streaming existed, you watched what was on TV and that was that. We now have the power to choose what we want to have on in the background as background noise. And we're often choosing these beloved shows. And so I think that, you know, picking up a show on a plat this show on a platform, even though it only has one season left, would show its dividends based on how many people stay on that platform just to rewatch it. But I think you highlighted it there. You said earlier about, um, you know, uh, cis hep white men only want to see content they struggle to reflect themselves in other media because they're frankly not used to doing it you know that's the big problem right they are not taught women are i'm being very binary here sorry no, women fine. are taught it's true in childhood that you know it's okay that you can't see yourself as doctor who or james bond just pretend you can pretend you're also someone like that or something like that and men are not and when you do cosplay that they get mad <laughs> yep yeah. Oh, yeah. So you know these these CEOs, these people in charge of our of our content, and I'm going to call it content because there is such a shift away from quality storytelling to content because that that's that's what the pandemic has massively cemented for a lot of things. You know, there is no yeah. there mm -hmm. is no urgency for them to change it because they are still in. There is no the the place is still the same, and I think. I think it's why it's so heartbreaking when we do get shows like Our Flag right. that do come along and kind of buck that and resonate with all of you here that are talking to me and the 40 people that sent me stuff and the hundreds of people that are keeping it trending online and all the people that are silently, you know, the, the silent consumers who have mm -hmm. just watched the show or want to watch the show or, you know, whatever. And it resonates with them in a way but because we're so not used to having that, because we're so not used to seeing ourselves, it hits home really hard. But also we expect mm -hmm. it to be taken away. And, you know, I know this, you're already, you're part of this huge campaign to not have it taken away. But it's a fight that we are, that you are not surprised you're making. I'm kind of, you know, like I said, yeah. you know, baby gay. So it, it's to me, this is the first time. Sucks, doesn't this it? has happened. Um, I think the thing that like hurt me most with it is, but devastated is I devastated. Was, um, 
in the most like yeah. gay fashion possible, I was on Discord call playing Stardew Valley with one of my friends when the um, cancellation thing came up. And we, we just finished our day on the farm. And then my friend was like, oh, shit. And I was like, oh, like, well, what's up? And did you see? And then we saw they'd been cancelled and stuff. And we kind of just sat there in silence for a while. But my first worry um, was, shit, I'm going to lose this community. I've built mm-hmm. such a close-knit community through this show both online and in person and that was my first worry was like what if all these people that I've become close friends with some of them might not be close friends it could be someone that I say that I maybe like their tweet once in a blue moon or something I'm gonna lose yeah. these people and that was my worry and it's I think that's a worry for queer communities in any kind of setting is you don't want to lose that because it's found family really and especially when we're in the day and age we are where found family is not the same people in your town or your village or your city found family are yeah. you know people across literally across the world you know uh, you guys here are talking as as a found family whether you acknowledge that you might all be weird cousins to each other but you know you're all you're all here somewhere down the line. <laughs> you're all here as a family weird cousins that we shouldn't marry <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I want to tell you a, story, a conversation that was going on at ECCC last year. We were sitting around this group of us who were on a group chat and we had met <laughs> at ECC. See, yeah. And yeah, I forget halfway through, you know, ADHD is a bugger. Um, and quite a few, and I'm going to call them girls because I'm fucking nearly 60 and they're, you know, having babies. They were saying that they were worried about going home because they felt like being at ECCC, Mm, they'd had a little slice of how life should be because they had been in with their crew and they had been in with these people that they talk to every day and that's where they're safe and that's where they're held and that's where they're seen. And I said, the thing is, wherever you go, when you go home, to a partner that understands that you're non-binary or a partner that doesn't want to talk about it or, you know, it doesn't matter. You go back into an office and they don't know who you are, but we do. No one can take that from you and no one can cancel that for us. They can opt not to pick up the show. We are never going to opt to look after each other. That's in our hands. We do have power over that. That's been hugely comforting for me. And I think it's been hugely comforting for a lot of people. So I think we're, we're talking about content, how important it is. And, you know, we I'm saying this when, as the point of recording, we've had the Oscars nominations come out and we're all getting massive, massive hard-ons for Oppenheimer mm. and the story of the guy that blew up all the Japanese. Don't get me wrong, I fucking <laughs> love Christopher Nolan. But it made him feel a little bit sad to commit mass murder. That's powerful art. <laughs> yeah, but we know how to market that. But there's, and Oppenheimer is a really powerful and I think important piece of art to make. Um, but I think it's very telling that uh, Barbie <laughs> has has um, not been nominated for any of the lead categories, um, particularly Greta yeah. Gerwig not being nominated for Best Director for what is possibly the best homage to the golden age of cinema put to screen in the last 50 years. Mm-hmm. Um and quite feminist. Yeah, but they already have one woman nominated in the Best Director category. Let's not get too crazy. Let's not get too crazy. Men, no, 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 no. Let's 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 not let's not let's not take this too far, guys. Periods will sink. It will be a disaster. The thing is, though, that that the nomination. <laughs> The nominations, mm. like people just like, because I think Jennifer Lawrence said this, you know, like the envelope just turns up at your house, and and like you don't, like they don't decide in concert. So it, but it is still a reflection yeah. of the white supremacist imperialist. Blah 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 blah. blah. Well, I think it's it, to me it really highlights the tokenism still and the tokenism that we've spoken about that you don't feel with this show, but clearly the people 
making the mm. decisions to make these shows are still working on. You know, they have they've the, the reason Barbie has not been nominated for Best Director is what I've heard a lot today is because they already you know they had a, a more art house or a more politically appropriate piece that was directed by a woman nominated and Margot Robbie not being nominated for Best Actress criminal um but they're saying but you know this is the first time that uh, a woman of uh, native american descent has been nominated so it's all kind of we've not done this one thing but we have done this other thing that you should give us kudos for. Mm-hmm. i think that's that's what i'm trying to say and and that's i think where this show is so great but where the executives don't understand it is they're like well we've done that virtue now we're now on to the next thing you know um fuck knows what that's going to be but you've kind of had your time this is you've had your thing you can enjoy that now um because i've seen lots of people saying we shouldn't be annoyed that margot robbie wasn't nominated for best actress because we had this as well and i'm like well we could have had both yeah but we can have both can we not have ambition? we can have it all we like have vision. yeah have vision Inve- envision a better future where we're not just all fighting for one like at least there was one if multiple women did something notable this year which multiple women did why are we afraid to nominate more than one woman for best director i think they really need to define redefine what they mean by support because i don't think what they think it means like they think they're doing people good by highlighting one person to be like their token and in doing that, they're, they're not really doing the good deed they think mm-hmm. they are. And that, that comes up with the show, too. Like, if you put these shows on and then you cancel them, you're not actually supporting that community. They did like, for as long as they thought it was profitable. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> what, more, what more do you want from them? They posted a black square in 2020. Like, come on. <laughs> Not the black square. Uh, every. <laughs> They're centering all of these conversations about support around themselves rather than around the people they claim that they're supporting. And that's not support. That is not advocacy. <laughs> if you're centering yourself in those conversations, you're really just aiming for a pat on the back. They allowed you to support them, though. Like, how do you not see that? They allowed you, you know women people of color to support them as the white cis male like i don't see how you don't see how heroic that was for them and they could have had other men supporting them they could have had other men supporting them but instead they gave that opportunity of playing second fiddle and being you know just completely subservient to the, they gave that to a woman like how do you not see that all they've done for you in feminism Stacey, you sound so ungrateful. I, just... I, I need to be more thankful to the people. You know, maybe if you bought that. some merch, they might think about it, but, you know, for now. <laughs> I was just going to say, the whole, like, centering themselves, everything about themselves, it's like how HBO Max have the uh, human by orientation <laughs> account thing. Yes! They're like, yes, we'll post our little gay snippets. Um, yes. But, like, okay, Nuggets. why isn't that on your main... So I wonder if these executives, like I was saying earlier that the executives probably don't even know that like 6% of the population are deaf or uh, hearing impaired. I would like to know how much of the population are tone deaf. And I was I was like everything that you've said during the course of this um, this podcast, Cece, I'm, I'm listening to it and I'm thinking this is like when Obama was president. And it was intelligent, and it was measured, and it was thoughtful, and it was researched. I was like, and but, then, but Melania bought class yeah. back to the White House. Did you not know that? I want to know who they think their average consumer is. I want to know where they're deciding what's best for White consumers, boys. because when you have hundreds of people flooding their social media every day, flooding their phone lines every day, flooding their faxes and literal physical mail mm-hmm. inboxes saying don't do this and yet they still do it his opinion matters and then to that point to what degree are these streaming companies actually beholden to their customer at probably the best place i can find to draw this to a close we've been uh in people's ears for over an hour now and uh it's like 5 30 in the morning it's not. It's nearly six in the morning and we're still recording. So I'm going to cut it off here. Have any of you got any last comments you want to make or statements? And can you also tell people where they can find you online? Because that's really important. 
I am un- <laughs> I'm unfortunately my chem para park on Twitter because I am very into my chemical romance Paramore and Lincoln Park. We have to keep believing that a better world is possible and that a more inclusive, not even inclusive world, because that sounds, to me, that's so belittling. One that reflects the reality that a lot of us live in. I genuinely, genuinely hope that our flag is put to a network that treats it better than they were treated HBO Max, much better than they were treated for season two. And that they're able to tell their stories in the way, tell their story and finish their story in the way that they want it to be. But on the off chance that it's not, I just want to say, like, you have to keep, you know, it's all we have. Keep believing that a better world is possible. And I just remember even after getting into Our Flag, which just just happened to get into, it opened me up to so many different things. Like, I, after watching Our Flag, that's how I got into League of Their Own. That's how I got into Good Omens. That's how I got into Interview with a Vampire when that was airing and watching that live. I remember just in 2022, just being like, I didn't know this was happening. I didn't know this was, like, possible that we could have stories like this where we're, we're, we're centered. We're not, like, a side character. We're not, like, dead. We're not all, you know, like, dead and things like that. Ugh. Um and just being like, wow, this is like the kind of media I've always like wanted and wanted to see. And now it's it's finally, it's finally happening to see like, you know, now of course being like our flag, a lot of like, you know, canceled people have to like trying to find and argue for like good omen season three and just seeing like, anyway, I just really would love to go back to the, like the feeling of just being like, wow, this is really what media can be. And I feel like we've seen what it can be and we should stop settling for less and that we shouldn't have to settle for less and you know fuck any streamer trying to make us settle for less like we deserve to be seen fully in our as entire beings and not just as a sidekick and not just as a side plot and not just as a coming out and not just as a tragic unrequited love like we deserve to just be having some weird historical drama where a suit is cursed and we're you know running around a ship and silliness and and joy and levity um my main takeaway from everything that's going on is just that stories of queer joy deserve to have endings on their own terms we rarely get that and i think our flag is the prime opportunity to actually have that happen um it's a shame that it's like it's ended up happening this way but we can always turn that around and if that could be vocal fans streaming services picking it up anything like that then so be it um i am honeybees boy on twitter um i write a lot of stuff and one of the things i did recently was i made a decentric AU generator thing that's online you can literally put them in any kind of situation Ed and Steed Ed can be a photographer Steed could be I don't know a land surveyor anything it there's all there's a professional clown as one of the options as well I am pointed in the extreme with HBO for their decision for having disappointed so many people when it's clearly so much to so many people and it's brought people so much love and solace and support and I find that kind of corporate behavior really disgusting because it's not hidden you know we're not it's not that we're not being obvious about it like we weren't not being obvious about you know give us dvds might have made some money then um uh so if you want to listen to my ranting and raving on Twitter, Instagram, and probably not Tumblr because I always forget I've got it. It's at Posh Tater, P O S H T A T E R. Um, I record a podcast with the Husbeast, which is called The Realm of Nerdguard. Um, unfortunately, we have ADHD, so we do forget to uh, record more often than not. But there are some out there, and we might remember to do another one. I I think my overwhelming feeling with this is just hope. I'm trying to retain the hope in everything, despite how bad everything looks right now. Um, I'm excited by 
the fact that we could potentially be shopped out elsewhere. And I am excited for that, what that could mean for us. Um, and I hope that any streamer who considers doing so knows what a good thing is in their corner by having this on their platform. It's things beyond measure that I can possibly imagine, but this is the kind of program that people wish was on their network, that people wish they were the ones to come up with. Um, in terms of me, um, I'm at gingerly vibing on Twitter. Um, I am professionally annoying. Um, so if you go on there, you can find me, um, talking about random stuff and putting these men in situations that often involve theater, um, in, in the sense of fan fiction. And that's it for another episode of the Narrative Labyrinth and the end of our two-part special. I want to really thank all of my guests for coming on. It's been so great to have such a great number of voices. And I want to thank you, the people that are either listening for the first time because you found through the fandom or if you're a regular listener to the Narrative Labyrinth. And take this opportunity to say if you have enjoyed it or if you've really hated it, why not leave us a review on the streaming or podcasting site of your choice my name's rachel and i've been your host you can find me online under strange rachel or obviously the narrative labyrinth and we'll be back soon ish with our next season of the show in the meantime don't forget to go back and listen to some old episodes thank you very much for being here <laughs>